welcome to all who have joined us for worship today. Whether this is your first time or whether you are a regular worshiper with us at Trinity Presbyterian Church, we invite you to fill out our friendship register through the link provided on your screen or found in the bulletin. The flowers in the sanctuary today are given in loving memory of Julia Stokes by James D. Stokes. Congratulations to Emily and Jero Kelk on the birth of their son, Jacob Albert. Trinity supports racial justice. As people of faith, we at Trinity Presbyterian Church lament over the recent violence against black people in our country and over the systemic racism that permeates our society, including the church. If you have driven past the church this weekend, you may have noticed street banners that proclaim Trinity supports racial justice. We must respond to the call to listen and discern and to compassionate action. We hope you'll go to our website and click on Trinity supports racial justice. On that page, you can find out more about how you can be involved. If you're feeling sad or lonely or just confused during this time of restriction, Stephen ministers here at, Pres at the church are good listeners and they're willing to talk with you. Just call one of the Stephen leaders and a caring conversation partner will be in touch with you. Scott Calhoun, Meredith Daniel, Paul Marston and Calico Perry and Cindy Stancil are among those you can contact, or if you prefer, you can send a confidential email to stephenminister at trinityatlanta.org and someone will reach out to you. Trinity's Hunger Relief Fund is in its last week, and so we ask that you contribute generously to this fund that seeks to provide immediate food assistance to our most vulnerable neighbors. The funds given to this hunger relief will go to in-town collaborative ministries, Meals on Wheels Atlanta, and Second Helpings Atlanta. It does end on Tuesday, June the 30th, so please give generously in the times that are remaining. Also, we've been offering a number of summer socials uh, via Zoom chat. We hope you will be part of one of them. Look for an opportunity to join a summer social, to get to know a Trinity member you've never met, or just to have a fun evening together. They're relaxed and intergenerational. To receive information about July dates, please sign up to participate at www.trinityatlanta.org slash summer social. Let us worship God. Please join me in the call to worship. With the psalmist, we cry out, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? We ask God to give light to our eyes. We wait for God to answer us. We will trust in God's steadfast love. We will rejoice in God's salvation. We believe God deals bountifully with us.
We now come to the time in our service in which we collectively go to God and affirm that we have all fallen short of God's glory. Please join me now in our prayer of confession. God of justice and mercy, you act in ways beyond our understanding. Your call makes ultimate demands upon us and all that we hold dear. You ask us to love you with all of our heart and mind and strength. You command that we have no other gods before you. Yet, we fail again and again to understand your ways, to love you wholeheartedly and to abide by your commandments. Forgive us, we pray, for divided loyalties for trust that wears thin. Forgive our pale versions of justice and our grudging mercies towards others. Keep with us, keep after us on this journey of faith, we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Through Jesus Christ, we have hope and forgiveness. And it is through his death and resurrection that we are forgiven. Amen. Please join me in our prayer for illumination. Gracious God, shine your light upon this world, upon our country, upon the church, and upon our own hearts and minds, so that the word that we hear read today and its proclamation might be pleasing in your sight and build up the church for service to your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Our scripture reading today comes to us from Genesis 22, verses 1 through 14. You may remember that last week, Richard started us off by telling us the story of Abraham and Hagar and Ishmael in a very difficult time. Today's story is no easier. Listen for God's word to us. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up, and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? 
Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, The Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, On the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The late 1960s and 70s were a time of testing for our nation. Unrest and civil disobedience rocked our society over a variety of issues of justice and equality and the devastating effects of the protracted war in Vietnam. Last month marked the 50th anniversary of one of the most terrible days during that period. On May the 4th, 1970, During an anti-war, anti-Vietnam War protest at Kent State University, four students were killed and nine others injured when armed National Guardsmen opened fire on the crowds. That incendiary and divisive event became a moment of national reckoning. A few years after it, a federation in Ohio commissioned sculptor George Siegel to create a memorial to the four students who died that day. Siegel chose our biblical story from today to represent that moment in our history. Upon a large stone, Siegel sculpted Isaac on his knees, hands bound with rope in front of him, head tilted up toward his father. Abraham stands close above him, looking down into his son's face. Abraham grips a knife in his right hand, pointed into Isaac's chest, and Abraham's left hand grips his own thigh, digging deep into his flesh in an agony of doubt and skepticism about what he is about to do. When the board of the university saw this commissioned sculpture, they rejected it. They deemed it inappropriate. A year later, in 1978, Princeton University accepted this bronze cast sculpture for its campus. And you can find it today still. It's located at Princeton just behind the university's chapel. We are in another time of national testing. Unrest and civil disobedience and protests are erupting because of this country's chronic disease of racism. It is perhaps not surprising that sculptures once again evoke strong feelings among us and are contested over what they represent to us and about us. I have become aware in new ways of how my own white privilege has enabled me to walk around southern cities and small town squares all of my life and hardly think at all about the Confederate statues and monuments that stand in prominent places, often in front of the county courthouse 
or near the economic centers of the shops on Main Street. I guess I assumed that they had been erected right after the Civil War to honor some local hero or well-known public figure in town. I, I've driven down Monument Avenue in Richmond, Virginia, dwarfed beneath those giant horse-mounted luminaries of the Confederacy and thought nothing more of them than that they were over-aggrandized and now slightly embarrassing tributes to the defunct capital of the failed Confederate States of America. Until the 2015 massacre of church members at Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston and the 2017 Charlottesville neo-Nazi and KKK rallies, I had not fully considered what it must be like for African Americans to have those figures looming over them in perpetuity. I had no idea most of the statues and monuments were erected long after the Civil War, during the period of Reconstruction, during the Jim Crow law years, in the 1910s and the 1920s when black Americans were making slow and hard-earned gains in freedom and economic stability and even prosperity in some places. While many white Southerners defend these ubiquitous Civil War statues as monuments to our heritage, we can do so no longer without recognizing whose heritage is being honored and whose lives are left to live under such heavy shadows. The plain research demonstrates how often these public statues on public land were erected to be an ominous threat to serve as a reminder to black citizens of who held the power over public commerce and courts of justice, and in honoring the time of the Confederacy, showing also to what lengths they, we, were prepared to go to hold on to that power. At so many other turning points, in our history as now, we are once again facing a time of testing, battling still this chronic disease of racism with its vast array of symptoms and its heavy death toll. Perhaps like some of you, for too long I have been privileged enough to remain vaguely aware but personally for the most part untouched by some of the worst effects of this insidious disease. Yes, I occasionally come across disturbing state and national statistics detailing health and economic disparities between white and black persons, how a pregnant African-American woman in Georgia has a mortality rate four times higher than white American women in Georgia or that the wage gap between black men and white men today in 2020 is equal to the wage gap from 1950. That black men are two and a half times more likely to be killed by police than white men during their lifetimes. But statistics don't have names and faces. So it's easy in a way, to know, but not really know. Then on May 25th, 2020, late in our nation's life and, and later than it should be in my own life, I saw it undeniably. I became a witness, along with thousands of others, to that eight minute and 46 second video that played out the long and slow and agonizing death of George Floyd. And it came not too long after I'd seen the chaotic video of two white men chasing down Ahmaud Arbery with their truck and their gun as he jogged through a suburban neighborhood. Soon afterward, I would learn about Breonna Taylor's violent death in Louisville 
from a mistaken no-knock warrant in her own home. And then Rayshard Brooks came afterward, lying dead in a Wendy's parking lot. And I can't say any more that I just didn't know, because now I know. The biblical story we read today is disturbing. Walter Brueggemann says that it is the most theologically demanding story in all of the Abrahamic tradition. I would go further than Walter goes. I would put it in the top 10 most theologically demanding stories in in all of scripture. After all, Jewish and Christian and Islamic scholars have all wrestled with its meaning and implications for centuries. In Islam, tradition holds that it is Ishmael, not Isaac, whom Abraham took to Mount Moriah that day to sacrifice. But either way, you tell that story. The scripture is clear that both of the sons of Abraham are nearly sacrificed in violent ways. Last week, Richard recalled how Abraham and Sarah together rejected the slave woman Hagar and Ishmael, leaving them both to die in the wilderness. Last week, and this, death is narrowly averted each time by an angel of the Lord who appears at the last minute with a well full of water or a ram caught in a thicket. We could use more interventions from this angel of the Lord today. The clear overriding message of Genesis 22, of course, is reassuring. It is that God provides In our moments of deepest need, we can count on God to keep God's promises. God is a God who provides. Our God is a life-giving God, especially when death seems to be the only option left. Underneath the story, of course, are a lot of messy details that complicate that overriding message of divine provision and care and life. But I'm telling you, if we had four weeks or four millennia, we would only begin to scratch this story's surface. And and even then, I doubt that it would be any easier to understand or more comfortable to recall. No, this one is a life-size story cast in its heavy bronze within the biblical canon. It's easy to see why, why many people have rejected it altogether and others of us receive it, but we put it around back behind the chapel where we just don't have to look at it very often. At this moment in our time of national testing, I found myself drawn to one thread in this story among the great tapestry of threads one might choose to pull out. Walter Brueggemann is the one who noticed it. He invites us to follow the plot line thread that weaves from verse 1 specifically to verse 12. The story begins in verse 1 with this simple statement, God tested Abraham. Presumably, Walter writes, this is not some game God is playing. God genuinely wants to know something that God does not know. The plot line then moves toward verse 12 when God will say eventually, now I know. What comes between verses 1 and 12 is is no flat storyline. What comes between those two verses is a story that can only be understood, Walter writes, if we see that there is a genuine movement taking place in the history between Abraham and God, some deepening that moves God from testing to now I know. The hinge verse between 1 and 12 comes at verse 8 when Isaac asks the fearful question, Father, where is the ram, the lamb for the burnt offering? And in verse 8, 
Abraham summons everything he has inside of himself, everything he knows of God, and with trust, Abraham makes this affirmation of faith. My son, God himself will provide. Abraham has been a man of faith, trusting God since Genesis chapter 12 when God first asked him to leave everything he knew to go to a land as yet unnamed where God would reveal to him a great future with sons and descendants that outnumber the stars. Sometimes against all evidence to the contrary, Abraham trusted God to make good on that divine promise for a better and fuller future. But Abraham also failed to trust God plenty of other times, failed to think that God really would or could provide, and and that's when he would take matters into his own hands or, or turn them over to Sarah. And so at Genesis 22, we find God not sure. Will Abraham trust me, God wonders, above everything else? even if it were to cost him personally and dearly? Is this the right person? Did I, did I choose the right person and people to carry forward the future that I actually have planned for the world? Sometimes I think so, God must have said. Sometimes, though, I think he doesn't love me or trust me with all of his heart and his mind and his strength. It's going to take everything for Abraham to carry forward this huge future I've got in mind, God says. And so this test comes for Abraham because God genuinely does not know. And Abraham walks that whole hard way, holding on to every ounce of courage and faith that God will provide the future God has promised. Abraham keeps walking slow, painful, agonizing steps toward Mount Moriah, though he is afraid to go, and he can't imagine what God has asked of him and why. But by verse 12, God says, Now I know. Brueggemann tells us that this story makes it clear that faith is serious business. Most of us, he says, and I think he's right, prefer our easier civil piety that's so prevalent in our country. We prefer a God who blesses what we have acquired for ourselves by our own privilege and our own hard work, and we prefer a God who's not going to demand very much of us either. A God we can understand and we can contain within our own zones of comfort. Unfortunately, Walter Brueggemann says, that's not the God we have. With our God, faith is serious business. And at this moment of national testing, I think we are demanded to be people of serious faith indeed. God continues to entrust to us in no small share the future that God has planned and that God intends for all people. And how we choose to act, how we choose to be the church in this moment matters very, very much. I don't know, God says. Let's let's see what they will do. In Coventry, England, the outer shell of a medieval cathedral sits in the open air. It was bombed almost to oblivion during World War II. What is left of it stands as a witness to the violence and death we so often inflict on people we deem our enemies. Next to the bombed-out medieval cathedral, 
is the new modern Coventry Cathedral that is filled with, with glass and with light shining through the windows. There are very vibrant colors in every rainbow hue there is, and they resound off the walls of the cathedral. When it was to be dedicated, Benjamin Britten was commissioned to compose music for the occasion. In his War Requiem, Britain blends the movements of the Latin mass with nine poems of Wilfred Owen, who was a British soldier and poet who was killed in World War I one week before its end. One of those poems, the one that comes at the offertory, is the recounting of this story of Abraham and Isaac. Wilfred Owen wrote it in the form of a sonnet, using that classical sonnet structure of 14 lines. He uses Im images of World War I as the sonnet builds toward its climactic 14th line with these words. Then Abram bound the youth with belts and straps and builded parapets and trenches there and stretched forth the knife to slay his son when, lo, an angel called him out of heaven, saying, Lay not a hand upon the lad, neither do anything to him. Behold, a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Offer the ram of pride instead. Then Wilfred Owen exceeds the classical 14-line structure of the sonnet. He adds two more lines to its contours and to the contours of our biblical story as well. The poem ends this way, but the old man would not do so, but slew his son and half the seed of Europe one by one. That was another time of testing, World War I. An opportunity placed before us, and we chose death by overwhelming numbers. Again and again, we come to these points of testing in our history. I imagine God saying over and over again from the heavens, I don't know, let's see what they will do. And the plot line always moves, faithfully, unfaithfully. And each time our relationship with God flattens or it deepens and expands and God says, now I know. On Friday, Trinity Presbyterian Church put up banners at each of our major entrances to the church. Your faith in action and mission committees took some time in order to reach a consensus on what people here were willing for this church to publicly state on those banners. A lot of Presbyterian churches have, have placed banners affirming the movement's moment, Black Lives Matter, and some churches, Black Lives Matter to God and to us. Trinity could settle on this. We support racial justice. The session has endorsed that and there will be opportunities for us to back up our words with actions in the coming weeks and months. God entrusts to us significant responsibility for the future God has planned and God will bring to completion. A serious faith places deep trust in God to provide what we need so that we can respond with courage and boldness. Sometimes we in the church are willing to risk everything, trusting God alone for the future before us. 
Sometimes we in the church decide that we prefer to maintain our monuments to the way things have been, and we find new representations inappropriate. In a time of testing, God waits to discover if our relationship with God and and with one another and with others beyond our number will flatten or will grow deeper and expand. And in time, God will then say, now I know. Please join me now as we go to God in prayer. Lord God, hear our prayers. Hear our cries of suffering, our cries of dereliction. As we cry out asking to feel your hope, to feel your love, and to see your justice at work in our world and in our individual lives. Lord, as we see daily in the news, new instances of the coronavirus, greater spread and deaths, as we see people continuing to protest and march in the streets, calling for justice, Lord, we ask that you would hear those calls, you would hear those cries, and that through your spirit that you would speak into the hearts and minds and lives of everyone in this world, and right now particularly to our leaders, those who are called to lead, to lead with love, with faithfulness, and to do so justly. Lord, as cities and states and school districts and churches figure out whether or not it is safe for them to return this fall, we ask for your guidance. We ask for patience, Lord. Patience to do what is right and what is just. Patience so that we can move ourselves out of the way that we might care for our neighbor better. Lord, speak into our lives, but speak into our lives in such a way that it moves us to action. It moves us to live out our faith that loves you, that loves our neighbor, that helps us to walk faithfully and to seek justice. Be with all those who are hurting currently, Lord in all of the manner that they could be hurting because of illness, because of depression, because of death, and all the various pains that we experience and we see in our world. Give us comfort, give us peace, and send the body of Christ into each and every one of our lives to speak this good news that you have for us in Jesus Christ, to walk alongside us, help the church to truly be the body. Lord, help us to care for one another in the way that you care for us, willing to lay our lives down, to take up our cross. Help us to do this faithfully, Lord. Lord, we come to you now in the words that your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. When you give to Trinity, you give to a multitude of organizations that we support to help to seek justice, to care for our neighbor, to feed the hungry. As of recent, Trinity has raised $24,000 
to help address hunger needs within the greater Atlanta community. When you give to Trinity, you give to initiatives such as that. Give not out of obligation, but out of the multitude that we have each been given by God. You can give through text messages, through going online, or through sending a check to the church. Give to Trinity and give to the kingdom of God. Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus to walk with me.
Go out this day trusting in the God who provides. Walk with courageous faith. Walk boldly into the future God is bringing among us. And may the grace of Christ attend you and the love of God surround you and the Holy Spirit keep you, that you may live in faith, grow in love, and abound in hope today and always. Amen.